Let's remain standing as we hear the word of God read this evening. It comes to us again from the book of 1 John. We've reached chapter 5 on page 1023 if you're using the Pew Bible this evening. John chapter 5 and verses 1 through 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Let's pray together. Our glorious God of power and love, of truth and light, come, Lord God, we pray, come and shine upon us with the light of your word of truth this evening. Bless us, O Lord, again, as we open up its sacred, sacred pages. We pray that as we do so that you would open up our eyes to behold wondrous things from your law. Send forth your spirit of truth, Lord God. Guide us into all truth that we might rightly believe and that by the power of your spirit working in us, we might walk in all of your ways. For we ask for this in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. We've focused much on the subject of love, a major theme in John's epistle here, and we see that that theme continues even again into our text this evening. Again and again and again, we've seen that in many ways, John's letter here is a call to love. But we see this evening that perhaps even, even more fundamentally, this letter is a call to faith. It's a call to believe, a call to continue believing. I hesitate to suggest that anything can be more fundamental than love. What can be more basic than God's love? But apart from faith, we cannot know God. We cannot know God's love. Much less are we able to love with God's love. We only love because, as we saw last time in chapter 4 and verse 16, we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 tells us that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Christian, what is, what is the primary thing that God calls you to do this evening? First and foremost, what are you this evening? Who are you this evening? Well, you are a believer, and God calls you to believe and to continue believing. And he calls you even this evening to understand a fresh what a marvelous gift is the gift of faith. And so we see that our, our evening, this evening that our text begins and ends with statements about what is true of the one who believes. Faith, what a precious possession it is. Not faith in and of itself. Faith is only as good as its object. The one in whom we trust, Jesus, the Son of God. We do well to remember that it was not faith that came down from heaven and bled and died on the cross for our sins. But by God's grace, through faith, we come to possess the Christ who did. Through faith, then, all that God has done in Christ. Indeed, God himself has become ours and we have become his. By faith, our Savior's great victory over sin and death have become ours as through faith. By God's grace, through faith, we have been made one with him. And so what an encouragement. What an encouragement to the believers in Ephesus. It felt as though the world was against them. As John writes in the second part of verse 4, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And then verse 5, who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So this evening, let's think about what it meant to, the, to our brothers and sisters there in ancient Ephesus and what it means for us this evening to possess faith. Our message is this. As those who believe, as those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, we have overcome 
the world through his victory, which is ours by faith. And I want us to see how this is true as we consider three things about faith this evening. And the first is simply this, that faith is the chief fruit of the new birth. Faith is the chief fruit, the primary fruit of the new birth. Verse 1 says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And then down in verse 4, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. We have overcome the world by faith, which is the fruit of our new birth. It is true of you this evening, Christian, and every true believer, God, by his word and spirit, has worked in our hearts such a marvelous work that he's made us to believe. Everyone who has experienced this new birth has overcome the world because everyone who has, has been born of God believes. As I said, oh, how the, the Ephesian Christians needed to hear that. Remember how their faith was being challenged. False teachers had come, and they were breathing out lies. They were leading many astray, and those who remained, they, they, they were leading many astray, and those who were remaining were in distress, struggling emotionally. Confronted by the lies of the false teachers, they were be beginning to be tempted to question the most fundamental things Am I a child of God? Am I truly in fellowship with Christ? Do I have eternal life? Does God really love me after all? Do circumstances, trials in your lives sometimes make you feel that way? Perhaps you find yourselves feeling that way a bit this evening. Well, God reminds you that as you are simply believing, as you are holding fast in faith to the simple message of the gospel, well, that is evidence that is evidence of your new birth. Your faith is only possible this evening because you've been born of God. In the prologue to John's gospel, he wrote, John chapter 1, verse 12, that all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And then the next verse makes it clear that this was, this was not of their own doing, not the result of some great decision that they had made exercising their own free will. Now it says in John chapter 1, verse 13, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This, is, of course, is why we don't credit ourselves for our faith this evening. We do not congratulate ourselves, pat ourselves on the back for the fact that we find ourselves believing when our next-door neighbor may not be believing Instead, we humbly praise and thank our God while we pray for our neighbor. And this is a call to believe that the new birth is something true and real, to believe that God's grace is real. It is real in our lives, and it is no small thing in bringing us to believe. God has given us new life. Again, this very much uh, captures the heart of John's message. Remember, the reason he wrote this letter to assure the believers, you've been given new life. Chapter 5, verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. To have life, to have eternal life, means you've been brought back from death and made to live. And does this not wonderfully echo the purpose for which John wrote his gospel as well? The gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 31 said, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. We recall that the believers in Ephesus were tempted, tempted by the false teachers, tempted to think that, that they were missing out on some great thing. The heretics were saying, you don't have our knowledge. You don't have the kind of spiritual experiences we have. You're not seeing God, perhaps they were saying. So again, John was saying, don't believe the lie. They may indeed have a form of spirituality, but they do not have faith. They do not have faith, and they have not been born of God. On one level, I think he was encouraging the believers in these words by saying, it's the false teachers who are of the world 
And they are seeking to overcome you. They are seeking to overcome you by destroying your faith. The very fact that you are continuing to believe that is a victory. Your faith is Christ's victory. They are seeking to overcome you. Indeed, the powers of hell are being unleashed against you through their lies, through their efforts. But you have overcome them. You do overcome them even as you continue to confess with true faith, to confess the simple message which they are denying that Jesus is the Son of God. You have overcome the world by the victory of faith, by the victory of Christ, which is yours by faith as you simply confess that simple message. Let that marvelous, simple, marvelous truth encourage us all greatly this evening, people of God. Even in, even in the midst of our darkest trials, the gospel continues to be true. And even in our moments of, of greatest weakness, we may not feel it very much. And all we can do is, is muster up just enough faith, yet true faith by God's grace, to con con continue to confess that simple truth that Jesus is the Son of God. We do so as those who have overcome the world, those who've been born of God. So by God's grace, let us continue to do so. Not that we speak those words, Jesus is the Son of God, as if they don't mean anything, just meaningless words. Now, there's meaning behind that, of course. Our faith is a faith that has content. Those words speak to who Jesus is. They speak to what Jesus has done. And those who confess those words in true faith, of course, understand much about Jesus. And we, we understand that we are to surrender our lives to him. But our salvation is all of him. And we receive it all by grace. All by grace through faith, through the empty hands of faith. And as Peter reminds us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, even our trials, they, they serve to test the genuineness of our faith. And in proving our faith true, they remind us, remind us that our faith is something precious, more precious than gold, and that it will result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And our faith shows that we have been born again, as Peter again concurring with John writes, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, at the, end of the, at the end of the verse, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So as we simply confess, as we simply confess our faith, it reminds us that we have been born of God in our churches in our individual lives, in our families, leading our, our children in family worship, no matter what our circumstances, no matter what comes into our lives, let us hold fast to and confess that simple word of faith, remembering after all that it is by that word of faith, by the word of God, by his spirit, that he has given us life. Faith is the fruit of that new birth by the spirit of God. And by it, we have overcome the world. Faith is the fruit of our new birth. And then secondly, we see about faith this evening that through faith, we have been made to live in the realm of God's family love. The love theme continues. For the Christian, it will continue forever and ever. After all, as we have seen, love is of God. God is love. And God and his love are infinite and eternal. I hope that it does not bore you, but that it warms your heart and stirs up your love, your affections for your God to think much about and hear about again and again God's love. Well, here this evening, John invites us to think about it in connection with the message of that victory of Christ, which is ours by faith. The love message and the victory of Christ message go together, don't they? What is the gospel? What is the gospel but the good news of the triumph of God's great love, God's indestructible love. Satan hates God. Satan hates God's love. He's done everything he can to try to destroy it, tried to thwart God's love plan, did he not? That's what he did in the garden when he lied about God's love. Adam believed the lie. In Adam, we really forsook God's love. And as Adam's fallen race, we became a race of God-haters. 
but love would be even more supremely demonstrated, magnified in Christ's victory, the triumph of his cross. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. God will have his people whom he has loved, whom he will love. He has promised a new world where we will dwell together with him in light and glory, and he will love us forever and ever and ever. And we've already seen back in chapter 2, verse 18, we, when we learned about the old and new command of love, that for those who belong to Christ, that light of the age to come is already shining, even shining into the presence of this dark last and dark hour. I use the language of, of being brought into the realm of God's family love because uh, I like the way, I, I like to think of the, the sort of multi-directional flow of God's love within that realm, within the realm of the family of God. John helps us, does he not, to see, speaks kind of at once of the, this multi-directional flow. He helps us to see God's love at different, different levels. God loves us. We love God. We love others. And perhaps what comes particularly into focus in our text this evening is that privilege which is ours of being loved by others, loved by those who truly love the Father. Notice the logic of verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. You see what John is saying? If you believe, then you have been born of God, and as one who has been born of God, then you are loved. You are loved by those who truly love the Father. What encouragement to the believers in Ephesus who were feeling very much unloved. The false teachers and their followers were not loving them. But John reminds them, you are born of God, and those who love God truly love you. The fact that those heretics are failing to love you is further indictment against them. Despite all of their arrogant claims, they do not know God, neither do they, do they know his love. They do not love the Father. But not only does this expose the, the false love of the heretics, it brings wonderful hope and promise, wonderful hope for those who are truly in Christ, those who are in the truth. This, this should encourage us this evening in terms of our commitment to each other, our commitment to the fellowship of God's people, which of course is inseparable, but central to our faith. We must, must believe that God will have, that God does have a people who love him and who will love those who are born of him. Again, this speaks to each one of us. It speaks of our duty to love our brothers and sisters. And it speaks to us this evening of our need to be loved by our brothers and sisters. It speaks to our need to commit ourselves to the fellowship of God's people because there we are to live within the realm of God's family love. We don't, we don't do so perfectly because of remaining sin. That love will never be perfect this side of glory. Our brothers and sisters will fail to love us just as we will fail to love them, but that should never, never become an excuse for neglecting the fellowship of God's people. Reminds me of the, the story about the wife who was trying to get her husband to get out of bed because it was time to go to church, but he was refused and saying, I'm tired of that church. They can't stand me and I can't stand them. I won't go. Give me one good reason why I should go to church this morning. She, she said, you're the pastor. <laughs> Sadly, funny, because it's somewhat true sometimes, isn't it? Easy for us, any of us, to adopt an attitude which says, I don't want to be with those people. They don't truly love me. But such an attitude is an attitude of defeat, of defeat and an attitude which is contrary to true faith, isn't it? These are your fellow believers. These are your brothers and sisters. The victory of Christ is their victory and yours with them by faith. And so God calls you. God calls us. God calls us in faith to love others and in faith to receive the love that others show us. 
albeit in perfect love. We are to receive it. We are to receive it in faith as evidence and as an expression of God's perfect, infinite, and unchanging love in Christ. By faith, let us, let us live in the realm of God's family love. It's good for us to think about the relationship between faith and love. Love and faith. For John and for all of the Bible, love is inseparably joined together with faith. Think about how that's brought out by uh, the language of the Apostle Paul in numerous statements of Paul. Paul tells the Galatians, for example, that faith works through love, Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. He tells the Ephesians and the Colossians that he has heard of their faith in the Lord Jesus and their love toward all the saints, Ephesians 1, 15, Galatians chapter 1, verse 4. He tells the Ephesians how he prays that Christ might dwell in their hearts through faith that they might be rooted and grounded in love, Ephesians 3, verse 17. That same letter's benediction says, Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul rejoices in the good news of the Thessalonians, faith and love, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. And he exhorts them to put on the breastplate of faith and love, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8. He tells Timothy how the Lord's grace overflowed for him with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. There are numerous other examples as those called into fellowship with God through faith in Christ. We share in his love because by grace through faith we share in his very life. By faith we live. We live in the realm of God's family love. And then the last thing we see about faith this evening is that faith brings about a love for and obedience to the commandments of God. A love for and obedience to the commandments of God. How how wrong is the teaching or even just the mindset which says we don't need commandments. We live in the new age, the age of the new covenant. We're not under the law. We don't need to think about God's law. We don't need to think about commandments. We don't need to think about commandment keeping All we need is love. But we see that for John, love is inseparably joined together with faith. And love and faith are joined with or they produce commandment keeping. So this evening, we cannot claim that we love God or that we love God's people or that we are learning to love God or learning to love his people if we are ignorant of and failing to learn and put into practice the commandments of God. Verse 2 says, by this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. And then verse 3, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Think about that statement this evening. His commandments are not burdensome. I wonder if we really believe that. Years ago, I was a camp counselor at a Baptist Bible camp, and we studied 1 John that year, and as we were studying it as the the, uh, the camp staff, there was another counselor, a gal, who looked at those words and she said, how can it say that God's commandments are not burdensome? Of course God's commandments are burdensome. I remember everyone kind of sitting there speechless without any kind of answer. Perhaps we all think, indeed, God's commandments are burdensome. And here God tells us that they are not burdensome. I wonder if, these, if, if by these words... On one level, what John is doing, he's contrasting the simplicity of true Christian discipleship with that which the, the false teachers in Ephesus were trying to impose upon, uh, with which they were trying to burden the believers in Ephesus. As I've suggested, I think on one level, John was, John was reminding them that the Christian life is not about pursuing some kind of unattainable, secret, hidden knowledge. It's about simply trusting Christ. Trusting Christ and loving him and, and, and obeying him and walking in obedience to his simple commandments. What the false teachers were seeking to impose upon the believers was an unbearable burden which was contrary to Christ. In that sense, what was going on in Ephesus was not so different than what Jesus faced among the Jews even in his own day. When we think about the errors of the Jewish religious leaders among whom Jesus was ministering, we recall that Jesus really came to a people who were 
burdened by commandments, burdened by commandments which were additions to the word of God, traditions of men. And so Jesus came and he condemned the scribes and the Pharisees for teaching as doctrines the commandments of men rather than the commandments of God. Matthew chapter 15, verse 9. He said in Matthew chapter 23, verse 4, that they, they tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders. We know that in the Judaism of Jesus' day, if, if you became a disciple of a particular rabbi, you were taking his yoke upon you. You were, you were promi- promising submission to his interpretation of the law. And the mindset really was that one's right standing before God was dependent upon one's bearing, bearing even the heavy burden of such commandments. It was in that context that Jesus came, revealed as the Messiah, the true son of David, son of Abraham. And he came in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, and he said, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's interesting that much of the false teaching which plagued that early church could really be described as Jewish mysticism, certain effort to blend together pagan spirituality with Judaism. So there was insistence on adherence to to commandments, not just the moral law, There were elements of the ceremonial law as well, but they were distorted. They were distorted by their interpretations. In some cases, even pagan asceticism, which we talked a little bit about in Sunday school this morning, that is the the, the, the complete denial of any kind of physical pleasures and so forth. All of this completely contrary to the Christ who came and revealed himself as the telos, the purpose, the end, the fulfillment of the law. At any rate, indeed, the the, the false burden-imposing error of the religious leaders of Jesus' day was very much like the errors in Ephesus years later. We think about it in both cases. It really was going back and following the same lies which the serpent spewed forth in the Garden of Eden. It was denying and adding to the simple and clearly revealed true word of God. The people of God this evening, what was, what was already true way back in the garden, has been more fully revealed as truth for us with the coming of Jesus Christ. God's commandments, God's word, the gospel. God's word is not a burden. God's commandments are not a burden imposed upon us by a kind of cruel taskmaster with sin, sinister motives. That really was Satan's lie in the garden. Well, Christ has overcome Satan, and we are no longer enslaved to follow his lies. We know that for us, the commandments, the moral law, the commandments come to us from a loving God. They come to us as a means, not of of earning a right standing before him. They come to us as a means by which we are to enjoy fellowship with our loving God as we walk with him, as we live in him, as we live in his love. Remember the words of Christ, John chapter 14 and verses 15 through 17. If you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Can we say this evening that in in any sense that that commandment keeping is burdensome for the Christian? It certainly is part of our sanctification. Sanctification was never intended to be easy. We're we're called, are we not, to to die to self. We're to, to put off the burden of our old nature. We're called to take up our crosses and follow Christ. We know that for Jesus, Commandment keeping meant bearing an awful burden, did it not? He had to bear the great burden of your sin, my sin. Of course, we are not called to do that. We'll never be able to do that. But in another sense, we are called to take up our crosses. We're called to follow our Savior's example. We're called to 
called to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We all fall so far short of so doing. But of course, the beauty of the gospel, which is not a burden to us this evening, the beauty of the gospel is that when we do sin, the blood of Jesus washes us of all of our sin. We find that God's commandments are not burdensome because we're not trying to keep them for the purpose of earning our salvation. That would amount to carrying around the burden of the guilt of our sin. That would amount to, to living in the fear of judgment, which we've learned we are not to do. Uh, um, we, we'd be forever living in the fear that we're, maybe we're not doing enough. No, Christ fulfilled the law for us. Christ bore the burden of our sin. We do not. And the love of Christ this evening, it drives out the fear of judgment from our hearts. And so our fellowship with God is based not on our, our success in our commandment keeping, but on the merits, on the sin atoning blood and righteousness of Christ, which is ours by grace through faith. That is the victory of faith. But the beauty of the gospel is also that by his victory, we are set free and we are enabled more and more to die unto sin and to live unto righteousness. And that means, yes, more and more we are enabled to learn, to learn of and walk in obedience to his simple, clearly revealed commandments, to learn of them, to teach them to our families, to teach them to our children. This is all part of our loving God and loving each other. And all of this, it flows out of that victory, which is ours by grace through faith in Christ. The psalmist knew of that grace, did he not? Even living in the shadows of the old covenant. And yet, think about the way that he approached the commandments of God in Psalm 119. For him, commandment keeping was not a kind of bearing, an awful load. It flowed out of his his new birth, his enlarged heart, it flowed out of his faith. And so he was running around, running about in freedom. Psalm 119, verse 32. I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. As it was for the psalmist, how much more will it be true for you and me, brothers and sisters? As children of the new covenant, that truth is, 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 is in much greater glory it's been revealed for us. Living according to the commandments of God is not burdensome. It is the freedom. It is the freedom of laying hold of that life which is ours in Christ. So let us go forth. Let us go forth in our Savior's victory which is ours by faith. Triumphant in him, let us run in the way of his commandments. Let us live together in the realm of God's love, for we have been born of him, and in our new birth he has granted us such precious faith. By that faith we have overcome the world. Let us pray. Father, we do bless and praise you and thank you this evening for all that you have done for us in Christ, all that you have done for us and all that you have become for us in him. We bless and praise you that that you have given us such a precious gift of faith this evening. And we ask that by your spirit, through your word, you might come to us, not only sustaining that faith, but increasing our faith, O Lord. As those who have been born by the spirit, help us to go forth and live by faith, confident of your love for us. Help us to go forth loving you, loving each other. Help us to live by your commandments, and thereby might we walk about in such marvelous freedom as those who are victorious in Christ Jesus. In whose name we do pray, amen.